Right. How to escape from prison. The remarkable story of how one man uh, defied the odds. Raw, honest and inspiring. Sir John Curran. Dr. Paul Wood. At 18, Paul Wood thought he had lost everything. He had committed an act he knew would send him to prison for many years. To a young man like Paul, it might as well have been for the rest of his life. Plunged into a nightmarish world of extreme violence, solitary confinement, gang allegiances, drugs, vindictive wardens and regular stabbings, Paul spent the next 11 years confined in some of New Zealand's toughest jails. Based on an account of his experiences, he wrote, while still inside, How to Escape from Prison chronicles Paul's road to redemption and a new life as a doctor of psychology, helping others strive to fulfil their potential and develop the resilience to flourish, even in adversity. This is a gripping read about a man who sank to the depths of despair before scaling the heights of true freedom. HarperCollins Publishers, HarperCollins Co. NZ Paul Wood is a doctor of psychology, motivational speaker, leadership and personal development specialist, media personality, husband and father. At 18 he was in prison and his life was completely off the rails. In his work today, Paul uses his subsequent journey from delinquent to doctor to illustrate the process of transformational change and how we can strive to be the best possible versions of ourselves. Paul contributes regularly to the media and works with a number of charities that focus on helping young men avoid a prison or reintegrate effectively on release. He lives in Wellington, New Zealand, www.paulwood.com How to Escape from Prison, Dr. Paul Wood, HarperCollins Publishers First published in 2019 by HarperCollins Publishers, copyright Paul Wood, 2019 This book is dedicated to the memory of my mother, Mary Jean Wood, no Thomas. I just wish you'd live to meet my wife, Mary Ann, and your grandchildren, Brax and Gordy. They would have loved you so much. Prologue. Um, the prologue is reasonably long. The walls were pink and were crowding in on me. There was nothing in the space except a bench with a blanket and a stainless steel toilet. The door had a small hole through which every now and then an eye would peer at me. Then the eye would disappear and I'd be alone again. I was numbed by the drugs I had taken earlier that fateful day but not so numb that I couldn't remember the events in detail, and not so numb that I couldn't feel the first panicky stirrings of withdrawal. Every addict is prone to the gnawing imperative of their cravings. For me, as for most addicts, drugs were an escape from reality. I had never needed the means to escape reality more than I needed them now. But part of that inexorable reality was the knowledge that there would be no escape, physical or mental. From time to time, panic or restlessness would drive me to my feet and I would pace from wall to wall. One, two, three paces, turn around, one, two, three paces back. Experiencing no relief, I would curl up on the bench again. I lay there, balled up, feeling trapped, buffeted by waves of sick realisation. Everyone who has ever made a major mistake in their lives, and that's everyone, knows the feeling when you've suddenly become conscious of the terrible momentum of time and how it can be halted, let alone re reversed, and how it can't be halted, let alone reversed. Everyone who has ever made a major mistake in their lives, and that's everyone, knows the feeling when you suddenly become conscious of the terrible momentum of time and how it can't be halted, let alone reversed. Sometime after midnight, there was a clatter of keys in the lock. Someone here to see you, the cop said. I was handcuffed and led to an interview room, sitting there on one side of the cheap for my table, his eyes downcast and his shoulders hunched, was my father. He looked up as I entered, handcuffed and wearing the white paper overalls they give you when they take your clothes for forensic analysis. 
I slumped into the chair opposite him and the cop took up a position next to the door. What happened? Dad asked. I didn't know how to answer. I wanted to tell him that whatever he had heard, it wasn't true. Or I wanted to tell him that it hadn't happened the way the police had likely told him it had. I wanted to say it wasn't my fault. I wanted to say sorry to apologise for heaping another blow on top of the blow he had just suffered. I wanted to promise to make amends for the hurt and misery I could see in his eyes. I don't think I said anything. Something was itching above my eyebrow. I lifted my hand and scratched. I saw Dad glance at the cuffs. I felt something crusty where I was scratching. I looked at my fingernail and recognised dried blood beneath it. I saw other flecks of blood on my arms and smears of blood on my wrists where I tried to wash them. I felt sick. I can't talk about it, I said, nodding in the direction of the cop. Not until I've spoken to a lawyer. When Dad had gone, my two older brothers came in, one at a time. I didn't have much to say to them either, especially since it had occurred to me that they were only being let in to see me because the police thought I might open up to them. They wished me good luck. My older brother, John, gave me some prison advice. Keep your head down and don't stand out. Be a grey man, somebody, someone nobody notices. Back in the cell, I realised that's what I had become, a grey man. All that promise and potential had been snuffed out, and I was just a husk. The faint excitement, someone my age, the faint excitement, someone my age, I was just eighteen, should feel in contemplating their many possible futures, was gone. I knew what my future held, prison. I didn't know how long I would be spending there, but I knew it was going to be many years. It might as well have been the rest of my life. Well, so far it's an interesting book. I think so many people are worried about prison, uh, whether or not they themselves are going there. A lot of people have uh, family members who are in prison and may have some kind of love for them, some affection, emotional bond. Um, my God. I need to eat something. I've only just woken up and got out of bed and got dressed. How long has it been? Seven minutes. Oh my God. Time flies when you're doing retarded videos. <laughs> I really should go over for the um, dictation how to escape from prison. The remarkable story of a man who defied the odds, war, honest and inspiring. John Kerwin is mentioned. So this is what we read. Blah, blah, blah. La, 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 la. Uh, it took seven minutes to read all of this. And it's got me hooked because, like, well, I've, I've bothered to take an interest in the whole thing. And, um, mother of his, uh, I want to know what he did. I mean, all it's done, like if you turn it into an imaginative movie in your mind, or even if you do make it into a movie, and I guess that's possible, um, I want to know what he did, because all it's painted so far is, um, this young man who's been sitting in prison. It's said that he's been on drugs and he's um, kind of all alone. You've got that picture of the cell and he described the cell well and he described the prison cell as pink. There's a bit of alliteration there, isn't there? Prison, pink, cell doesn't start with it. It have to be pale, wouldn't it? But, um, yeah, and so I want to know what he's done to get himself in prison, and I guess it, it, it's, it'll be a sermony book, because I swear the idea is to, um, well, to make money, but um, apart from the commercial aspect of it, it's to try and keep young people out of prison, I guess, um, but there we go, right, I'm stopping it now, and it's almost ten minutes.